Well, good morning. I'm glad you're here. The Lord is glad you're here. If you would, grab your Bible, turn to 1 John chapter 4. And as was mentioned earlier, let me just remind you, if you are one of our guests, we hope you will stick around after services. Let's get to know you and you can know us just a bit better. <clears throat> Several weeks ago, we left off our Blessed Assurance series walking through the book of 1 John. Uh, the holidays hit us. There were some things that I wanted to address as we began the new year. Uh, but I want to pick up uh, once again uh, with this series of lessons from 1 John and continue to work through this book. We left off with chapter 4. And so let's read the first three verses of 1 John chapter 4. <clears throat> Hear now the word of the true and living God. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world. Let us pray. Father, by your spirit within us, we pray that you would enable us to see clearly from Your Word, how we might test the spirits. We only want the Spirit that comes from You. And so help us, Father. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> On June 6, 1944, the Allied forces landed on the beaches of Normandy. It's D-Day. It's D-Day. It's what it's uh, come to be known as. And this, of course, was a turning point in World War II in the European theater. June 6, 1944. It is not until May 1945 that you have the death of Hitler and the surrender by Germany, thereby ending World War II in Europe. And of course, that's called VE Day. Victory over Europe Day. That was when the war was over, when victory was attained. So from June 6, 1944, with that turning point, that decisive moment in history, to May 1945, there was war going on. It's been noted that Christians live in the in-between. That we, as it were, live between our D-Day and the coming V-E Day. That is, we live between when Christ died on the cross and decisively <clears throat> delivered a death blow, the death blow, to the dominion of darkness and the final coming of Christ. His final return, which will mark the end of time, and judgment day occurs. We live in that in-between moment. And, and, and just like there was a war to be waged between D-Day and V-E Day, so also there is a war going on between the cross and the final coming of Christ. And we wage warfare between those two dates, as it were. We continue to fight and war against the powers of darkness and the powers of evil, the spiritual forces of darkness. We wage warfare as we wait until the final revelation of Jesus from heaven. And victory is finally and fully realized. 
part of that war that we wage involves very powerful spiritual beings who are set against us. Malevolent spiritual entities that seek to destroy us through manipulation and deception. That there are these spirits that assail the church in a variety of ways. But God has given us His Spirit. Look back. This is where we left off weeks ago. So, so let's just get a, a quick refresher here of 3.24 of 1 John. Chapter 3, verse 24 of 1 John says, Whoever keeps His commandments abides in God and God in Him. There's our fellowship. God in us, we in God. And by this, we know that He abides in us by the Spirit He has given us. We have the Spirit of God. God has given His Spirit to us and His Spirit dwells within us. And that indwelling of the Spirit is vital to our waging warfare successfully, victoriously, gloriously for our commanding officer, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a coincidence that from this statement of how God has given us His Spirit, that John then flows into the discussion of test the spirits. We are to test the Spirit. That is why, one of the, one of the reasons, Scripture talks about a number of reasons why God has given us the Spirit, but one reason, and the reason that we're going to focus on here in the text, is that God has given us His Holy Spirit so that we are able then to test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Well, how do we do that? How do we test the spirits? That's what we want to know, right? Well, we're going to discuss that here because John provides us with three litmus tests as to how we can discern spirits. The spirits of error in distinction from the spirit of truth. Three tests. We're only going to be looking at one this morning. We'll pick up the other two next week. Unless you want to sit here for an hour and a half and hear me. It's your choice, but... We're going to break it down and walk through these because they're so vital. There is, we'll call it the Jesus test. There's also, let's call it the spirit test. And then finally, there is the Bible test. But even that needs a bit of definition as well, which is given here in the text. And we'll we'll break down the other two next week. Just want to talk about one because it's so vital this morning, and that is the Jesus test. We pick up here in verse 1 of chapter 4. Beloved. Don't overlook that. That is a, a key term John uses again and again as he is addressing his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. But he loves his brothers and sisters in Christ. John loves the church. And we also ought to love one another. We ought to love the church as well. And so beloved. This also shows us John is writing not just to elders, or deacons, or preachers. <clears throat> He's writing to all Christians. That it is the duty of every Christian, not just for the super spiritual, not just for the leaders. All Christians are to test the spirits. All Christians are to be involved in this spiritual warfare because by default you already are. Indeed, every single person, whether they know it or not, whether they realize it or not, whether they like it or not, are involved in this very real spiritual warfare. And you are either in the camp of Christ as part of His army of saints who are to put on the full armor of God and wage war, stand against the evil one, or you are an unwitting captive, or perhaps even a witting captive. You know that you're, and that's what you want to be, is enslaved to the evil one. Or you are an unwitting captive of the dominion of darkness. Beloved, all Christians are to do this. Do not believe every spirit. That's your first command. And in fact, this could be translated, stop believing every spirit. It may be that the church to which John is writing, they're just welcoming in 
uh, every Joe Bag of Donuts off the street who claims to have some kind of prophetic utterance. And John says, stop that. Don't do that. Don't believe every spirit. Because not every spirit's from God. You see? No, you, you stop. Don't believe every spirit. And, and again, in the context, and, and we developed that weeks ago, so just quick refresher. One of the movements that was uh, just started to take root was what would eventually become full-blown Gnosticism. These were the guys who claimed to have had some kind of ethereal experience with the eons, and they had given some special revelation, and now, fortunately, you're so lucky to have me, and for the low, low price of X number of dollars, you can come to me and I, I could tell you about the special revelation that I got from God. Aren't you lucky to have me? And they would, they would manipulate people into giving them all kinds of stuff, money and uh, even giving over their bodies to them and just all kinds of distorted, perverted ways. Okay? That's who these guys were. You see how this can be harmful for people, especially for the church? The claim to have some special knowledge that you don't have. No, John is, is, is diligent at, at impressing upon these Christians. No, you do have revelation from God. You do have knowledge. It's not just for special people. Everybody has knowledge about God and about Christ and those sorts of things. And so uh, John says here, you got to remember that when these teachers show up, these false prophets, and John, again, not mincing language here, when they show up, it's not just the person. That's, that's one thing. And that person certainly should be confronted with truth. But there's also something in back of that false prophet. There is a spirit in back of it. Uh, even uh, one of the spiritual forces of darkness. Where do, where do lies come from? We know that the devil is the father of all lies. When he lies, he speaks his own native tongue. And he has very powerful uh, minions, a whole cohort of them. All the hordes of hell are trying to deceive people in order to destroy them. And so, yeah, stop believing every spirit. Uh, but rather, test the spirits. Another command, another imperative. Test the spirits. And originally, it had to do with testing metals to determine their worth, uh, to prove the genuineness of them. And so here's John saying, look, you've got to test these spirits to see whether or not they're genuine, they're true, which would ultimately mean that their origin is from God. And so you see immediately there are spirits that are from God and spirits that are not from God. Those spirits that are not from God, don't believe those. Ah, but the spirit that is from God is to, believe, is to be believed entirely. And so, test the spirits. And of course, the question now is, yes, John, but how? How do we do that? And again, John gives three tests here. And we're going to focus especially on the first test, the Christological test, the Jesus test. You test the spirits to see whether they are from God. What's its origin? You see, if these spirits have their origin with God, then that spirit is going to, verse 2, confess that Jesus has come in the flesh. That is a spirit. Every spirit that confesses that, and the idea of, of confession, the, the term in the original, homo logeo, and, and homo, that's your prefix for same. Logeo from logos, word. So it's the, these spirits come speaking the same word as God about Jesus. Every spirit that does that, that that's, that's a spirit from God. The false prophet isn't going to do that. They're going to bring a different word than God about Jesus. Every spirit that confesses. This is, this is how you know the Spirit of God, John says. That the Spirit comes and it confesses that Jesus, and this could be translated as uh, that Jesus is the Christ who has come in the flesh. Which would add a, another aspect on here, but uh, even then, uh, Jesus Christ, just in the name itself, implies that He is the Christ. He's the long-awaited Messiah of the Jewish people. The one that God had promised for so long. He's come. And He's come in the flesh. Uh, and so this, uh, this is, uh, again, uh, breaking it down here, uh, He has come. You can't overlook that. It is what's called a, a present tense uh, 
participle, actually. And all that means is this, and we've talked about this before, that the perfect tense has to do with past completed action with present continuing results. And so the idea is Jesus, he came in the flesh. That's a historical reality. That the Christ of God took on flesh, even God himself took on flesh, right? To use John's language from his gospel, the word was God and then the word became flesh. John 1 verse 1, also verse 14. So he has come, but there are continuing lasting effects as a result of his coming. Those effects, they continue. That the blessings and the benefits of God having come near continue to have an impact upon history and reality and especially upon the people of God. We, we ought to say here also that this spirit is from God because quite frankly, the fallen mind of humanity, the fallen minds of humans could not have come up with this idea of God condescending and leaving heaven in order to take on flesh and dwell among us for a time live sinlessly, and then go to a cross on our behalf, in our place, for our sins, even taking the curse of sin upon Himself, so that, having removed that, now we can have fellowship with God. That can only come from the mind of God. Humans didn't come up with that. Yes, that, that's the origination point. That's where it came from. It is so incredible. So impressive that it could only have come from God, from the mind of God. And that He has come in the flesh, we, we shouldn't overlook that. Because there were those apparently who were running around in John's day, uh, and, and the church knew about it, they were coming and saying that, well, no, Jesus being God, no, He, he couldn't have had a body of flesh. You know why? It's because matter is evil. But spirit, spirit's good. Matter's evil. Where would such a, a philosophy have come from? Dead giveaway. It came from philosophy. Uh, and, and certainly had roots in, in Platonic philosophy, Plato and all that. But these philosophers had spun out on it for so long and they developed certain tenets that they believed. And so one of them was, that spirit is good, but matter is evil. And so God, being a spiritual being, He can't take on a body of flesh because, well, matter's evil. And, and the spirit, God, can't have anything to do with evil stuff. But that philosophical presupposition simply is not warranted. It is unbiblical. And so when John says here that Jesus has come in the flesh, what he is revealing here, he's exposing the error of, again, these early roots of Gnosticism. In particular, the, the docetic flavor of Gnosticism. The docetic Gnostic said that it came from a, the Greek term dokeo, and it had to do with only, it, 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 it only seemed that Jesus had a body of flesh. Didn't really have a body of flesh. Didn't leave footprints in the sands by the seashores of Galilee and all that. He only seemed to have a body of flesh. How does that impact the gospel? Well, when he goes to the cross, he only seems to die, which means you only seem to have the forgiveness of sins, and you only seem to have a relationship with God. It's not real. You see how this stuff impacts the gospel? Why John is so dogmatic, right? He's so narrow. Well, no, he's, he is keeping with the truth. And the truth is, no, He didn't just seem to have a body. He came in the flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that is why He could, according to His human nature, die on the cross for us so that we really do have the forgiveness of our sins and we really do have relationship with God. No, this is, this is again, it's, it's vital to the Gospel. John goes on and says, verse 3, every spirit that does not confess Jesus, and that seems to be the summation of the previous point, Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that does not confess Jesus. In other words, this Jesus that John and the other apostles knew. If he comes confessing a different Jesus, he's not from God. That spirit is not from God. That prophet is not from God. This is the spirit of, ready, Antichrist. Now, 
we covered Antichrist many, many moons ago, so dig back in. Let's refresh this just briefly. Antichrist, according to John, is not a shadowy political figure who rises out of a revived Roman Empire in the European Union, perhaps. Right? He's not some, some mysterious figure who's yet to come in history, even for us. Remember, John has already said previously in this epistle, Antichrist, there are many Antichrists who come out. And he says here, which you have heard was coming and now is in the world already. John and the church then was not waiting on Antichrist to show up. Indeed, there were many Antichrists. The word itself, well, you recognize anti, right? Something that is anti-something is opposed to it, right? Well, here is one who is opposed to Christ. Opposed to the true picture of Christ. Opposed to the truth of God about Christ. That's the one who is anti-Christ. And you have heard was coming and now is in the world already. And again, the idea here is you heard and, and maybe you continue to hear that they're coming or this may be what is being said here. <clears throat> you heard and therefore know that this is the case, that Antichrist is coming. But again, now is in the world already. Um, they're coming on the scene and they are presenting a distorted picture of Christ which is running roughshod over the church, which is messing up people's faith. This is why John is so opposed to these false prophets. Why he uses some of the strongest language to condemn them is because he knows what a distorted gospel does to people and their faith. And he will not stand for it. And so, again, here's the first test. It centers on Jesus. What do you say about Jesus? Remember in the Gospels, one of the questions that Jesus asks is, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Who do you, my brother, my sister, who do you say Jesus is? What John is getting at here is, what view of Jesus is being commended by these various spirits? What view of the Christ is being assumed? In their day, it would have had to do with, again, the early roots here of Gnosticism, that Jesus is just one of countless eons. Various links in the chain that eventually get you to God. That is the one. But John is saying, no, that's not right. <laughs> All these spiritual beings. He doesn't deny the reality of the supernatural or the spiritual realm. He acknowledges, okay, you want to use that language of eons. You've got to recognize, yeah, there are many out there, but Jesus is greater than all of them. In fact, uh, and, and we'll talk about this in uh, next week, that there is one who is in you, and I believe that's the Spirit, who is greater than he who is in the world. And if it's true of God the Holy Spirit, it's true of God the Son. That He is greater than the world, and He's greater than all these other spiritual beings that are running around out here. That Jesus indeed is 100% fully God, while at the same time retaining His humanity, 100% human. John here is presenting to us spiritual discernment. How do you test the spirits? Number one, what do they say about Jesus? What do they say about Jesus? You see, a biblically informed doctrine of Christ is at the heart of spiritual discernment. You want to know about spiritual discernment? Get to know Jesus. Get intimately familiar with the Christ of the Gospels, the Christ of the New Testament, Jesus. Come to know Jesus. Why do we sing? Jesus, Jesus, let us come to know you. One of the reasons is I want to know you so intimately that when another Jesus is presented, I don't want that. I can identify it for what it is. There is a true view of Jesus. All other views of Christ are false views. 
this is, this is not popular today. Not, not in our pluralistic culture. We have many ways, many pathways up the mountain to God, many ways to God. Jesus, he's, he's one way, and, but there are others, right? Even in Christendom, to say that there is a true view of Christ, but other views are false, well, it's got to be loving. Don't want to break the 11th commandment, which is thou shalt be nice, right? In John's day, there was the true view of who Jesus was. It's the Jesus of the apostles. Why well, he's at pains to emphasize both the deity and the humanity and the messiahship and the, the substitutionary atonement of Christ on the cross on our behalf as our advocate, propitiation, that big Bible word and all that. All other views are false views. And 2,000 years of history have only made the assault on the identity of Christ more pronounced. You see... There have been those historically who have denied the deity of Christ. And it, long before our Jehovah's Witness friends were even a thing, you had the Arians way back in the 4th century, led by a guy named Arius, who it seems he may have been influenced by some of the Neoplatonic philosophy of his day. That was popular down in Alexandria, Egypt, way back when. Arius got the idea that, well, Jesus, he's, he's not fully God. He's, just, he's the Son of God, but He's not God. And as a result of his error, you had the Council of Nicaea that condemned him as a heresy, uh, as a heretic, and his teaching is heresy. And you had the Orthodox folks who... Uh, who, who made the clear, definite statement that indeed Jesus is fully God. And they rooted it deeply in Scripture. The, the tragic thing is, Nicaea happens in 325 A.D. And it is basically one guy, one bishop named Athanasius, who stands against the rising tide of Arianism that overshadows much of that 4th century. In fact, you eventually get an emperor who's an Arian. Athanasius stands against it, and he defends the true biblical doctrine of Christ and his deity. He is fully God. And at one point, it seems he's the only one standing. He writes a work, he writes a, 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 a work called uh, Athanasius Contra Mundum. Athanasius against the world. What about us, brothers and sisters? Well, we stand against the rising tide of those who would assault the true biblical doctrine of Christ and His deity? Many will say, oh yeah, He existed, He was a good teacher. But God? I'm not even talking about our Jehovah's Witness friends who come knock on your door on Saturday morning, right? Ever happened to you? Happened to me. They don't knock on my door anymore. <laughs> John fully persuaded and sought to persuade others that indeed Jesus is the Word who is God and became flesh. No, we do not deny the deity of Christ. We affirm fully that Christ is God to the glory of God the Father. But then there are others who will... They'll, they will make outrageous statements, outrageous for us, ought to be anyway, outrageous statements and believe outrageous things about uh, Jesus. For example, there are those who will say that Jesus is the half-brother of Satan. No, come knock on your door too. I'm talking about our Mormon friends. We believe that Jesus is the half. you got to dig for it. Trust me, you got to dig for it. But eventually you get to the point where they will affirm, yes, he's, he's the half-brother of the devil. And make unbiblical distinctions between the Godhead. They'll say that Yahweh is not Elohim. That there is Yahweh and then there is God. And, and, and Yahweh is the Father and Elohim is the Son. 
Isaiah 43, 12, just put that in your back pocket for when, if and when that conversation comes up with our Mormon friends. Because it is Yahweh who is speaking in that verse. Declares Yahweh, and then he goes on, he says, I am Elohim, I am God. This distinction that Yahweh is not Elohim is simply unbiblical. It is not true. Will we stand against the outrageous things that people say about our Lord? I'm not saying be obnoxious. I'm not saying be mean. I'm just saying be real. Stand for truth. John was willing to stand for the truth of the gospel because at the heart of the gospel is the truth about Christ. And then there are others who will deny the they will deny essential elements of Jesus' work. It is very popular in the academy, in universities, even Christian universities, to, de- to deny the substitutionary nature of the atonement of Christ. To deny that He actually died in our place. I think what it is is that many people want a bloodless gospel, if I can put it very pointedly. They want to eliminate the substitutionary nature of the atonement, which means... And, and really what it is, it'll sound like this. It'll say, you know, a God, the Father, killing His own Son. That's, that's so barbaric. It's actually pagan. Well-known speakers, well-known preachers will get up on Sunday mornings and say such things. What that betrays, number one, is a faulty understanding of the atonement. Betrays a faulty understanding in the second place of the Trinity. Because yes, it is true, the Father sends the Son. The Son comes willingly. But at the heart of that is God sending God. He Himself is the only one who can satisfy His own wrath for sin. That's the third thing. It's a faulty understanding of sin and the wrath of God against sin. One writer put it this way. Without exception... Liberal theologians refuse to accept the biblical doctrine that Jesus Christ always has been, is, and will be the Son of God, that He came from heaven to redeem His people, that He took upon Himself our humanity, yet remained truly divine, that He rose bodily from the dead and ascended in His glorified body to heaven, and that He will return at God's appointed day in the same body in which He ascended. If you compare the teaching of these theologians with God's Word, you will notice that their opinions are based on human philosophy and not on Scripture. The more things change, the more they stay the same. At the heart of what John was combating in his day was philosophy that was masquerading as biblical truth. And the same thing occurs even today. What do you say about Jesus? Again, that's... at the heart of spiritual discernment is a biblically informed doctrine of Christ. Why we need to be so familiar with Jesus, the Jesus that the apostles knew, that when error rears its ugly head, we can identify it for what it is. This is why God gives us His Spirit. One of the reasons why God has given us His Spirit. Why His Spirit, in a, why His Spirit is in us in the first place. It's to help us to test the spirits. Is it from God? If it's from God, it will agree with this. That's the Trinitarian nature, the Trinitarian harmony that is inherent in the revelation of God. You see, the Spirit of God is not going to disagree with the Spirit of God. Just as the Spirit of God will not disagree with the Son of God, nor will He disagree with the Father God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are united harmoniously and gloriously in revealing truth. That's why the Father speaks one word and the Son speaks another word and the Holy Spirit speaks another word and it's all the same word. Because the Son will not go against the Father. The Holy Spirit will not go against the Son. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are in glorious harmony with one another in revealing truth. And that's the case here with the doctrine of Christ. 
that the Father, through the prophets, predicted. He's coming. He's coming. And this is what he'll look like. Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, Psalm 16, the whole sacrificial system. And then the Son is sent by the Father and steps on the grand stage of human history and says, I'm, I'm him. I am. You search the scriptures. That's, they testify to me. And here I am. I am. And then the Father, the Son ascends to the Father's right hand, and the Father and the Son send the Spirit. And the Spirit uh, inspires the text of Scripture and, and moves these men to write what they wrote. And what they write is He came in the flesh, He's fully God, He's God and Savior propitiation for our sins, Redeemer, all of these. And that's the Trinitarian harmony of the Revelation. And that is why the Spirit of truth, that's the phrase that John's going to use and we'll look at it next week. The Spirit of truth, that's from God. The Spirit, capital S, of truth is from God. Every other spirit of error, not from God. Brothers and sisters, we are in the in-between times. Right now, we live between the cross and we live between the final coming. And we are in the midst of war. This is a war zone. And the war is not with bombs and bullets and tanks and grenades and all that. We know that we wrestle against the spiritual forces of darkness. It's not against flesh and blood. The spiritual forces, very real spiritual forces of darkness that are opposed and set against us. It is a battle for the mind and and, uh, we... Uh, seek to destroy every lofty thought that raises itself against the knowledge of God. And we do that through the Scriptures. We do that through a biblically informed doctrine of Christ. And we do it by identifying the spirit of error from the spirit of truth. Let's commit this to prayer. Father God, we pray for Holy Spirit wisdom so that we, mind of Christ, would be people who, with gentleness, respect, love, take every lofty opinion about Christ that is not in conformity with Your Word, but also positively present a true, biblically informed portrait of Christ to everyone as we share the Gospel with others. We can't do it on our own. We know that no good thing lies within us. But we give You praise, honor, and glory that You have given us Your Spirit, that He is within us, that You have given us Your Word, and that by it, we can come to know Jesus. Help us, Father. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen.